Hello, this is Ken, your podcast preacher, and I want to welcome you back to Deep Waters. This podcast is brought to you by Applied Strengths Ministry, where we believe working together in our strengths is the effect of working out the will and calling of God in our lives. The title of this message is Hoopless, Ringless, Rungless. Let's start off with the scripture that as we move through this message will be explained and make more sense than it might if it was left out here all by itself. 1 John 3, 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? You see, there's no hoop to jump through that results in any preconceived notion of a big payoff in either money, prestige, or position. There is no brass ring. In fact, the notion that the ring is brass and not gold should tell you who probably created this saying in the first place. As no one wants to give up the gold who has the gold. No brass ring anyway, no how. There is no ladder rung worthy of stepping, except in the one that extends from heaven to earth, with angels ascending and descending. Genesis twenty eight twelve. All of these ambitional traps do nothing but lead you away from your true purpose and calling. They are, as the Bible states, of those that believe in them, hypothetically speaking, clouds without rain. They do not produce what people think they produce. Let's look. Second Corinthians 12.20 For I fear least when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. Least there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, and tumults. Wow, what a crowd of nasty behaviors. Yet I say you can find these anywhere, that there is a ring thing hanging from the top rung of a ladder. Now before we go on, it's important to note that it does say selfish ambitions. So not all ambition is bad, but you must be aware that hoops, rings, and rungs are laced with the bait of Satan and can lead one astray. Let's see what Paul told the Philippians. 1 15, 16. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So now we see this bug in ministry as well. And if so, the hoops, rings, and things exist in the church as well as outside of it. Yes, I have been a part of a church. They use the promise of position to motivate you to continue to kill yourself in the position you are currently in, in hopes they would eventually place you in the position long ago promised. (laughs) And as crazy as it seems, I have both seen and experienced those who were in the positions that they were not called or equipped to operate in, and yet they were left there for others to clean up their mess. Now, I know this can sound derogatory, but listen, peeps, this really happens. You should know that so you don't sit in a wrong bird nest for a time. Ministering in this culture can train you to have selfish ambition, as you are trained to be a hoop swinger. Is there hope even for us? Yes. Let's look. Galatians 5, 18, 21. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Another host of badly bads. No, wait, these are even worse. Perhaps Paul reread his second Corinthians letter and noted that he left some of the evil descriptors out. So now my thought is that he included them here. Perhaps the crowd at Corinth wasn't moved so much by the Paul account, so Paul felt he had to step it up a notch in Philippi, you know, to make sure they really got it. Anyway, selfish ambition has some unruly friends, so look out. Hey, Ken, what about hope? Oh, yes, it was in the first sentence. Walk in the Spirit. Done. On we go. Philippians 2.3 Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now this is how we hope, and what we hope in, when we apply this in hope. Consider others better. If God wants to promote or increase you, he will. No man can shut a door that God has opened. And God can open any door that no man can shut. 
So now you see that selfish ambition is kind of the same thing as if someone who is not prepared to handle large sums of money wins the lottery. Oh yeah, some of you are like, yes, give me the chance to handle large sums of money and I will prove both you and God wrong. But in truth, large sums of money almost always handles its receiver. We overestimate our ability to be different than any of the other sinners who can be led away by various lusts, such as those chatted about in 2 Timothy 3.6. Now the widow and her two mites drew the attention of Jesus over and above any of the others who gave of whatever they had. Now I'm not saying if you win 50,000 Benjamins that you have to square it away with God, same as she did. King David and Solomon did not give all of their wealth to God. But here we are reading about her sacrifice and her understanding about the revelation of Jesus, as her offering was also speaking to him, and that he would be giving all that he had upon the cross, that we would be forgiven of all of our sins, and not just a portion of them. You see the power of just one word? All, all, all. So what little all are you holding on to? Giving all of this or that may release you to be able to apply your all to something more productive. So, but back to selfish ambition for gain. You know, gain is getting anything more than you already have. It's above what currently exists. And sometimes you are giving gain for the benefit of others. So let's look at this one thing regarding money and our unending appetite for it. What would the Christian church look like? And how would they better operate if, number one, no Christian was in debt? And two, all Christians tithed, that is, gave 10% of their first fruits that is, gross for those of you who have questions, to God, and offered what they could spare. Well, to the confused as to where God might be found, it is in the church. Now, I know I mentioned two things, which from today's position, look all but impossible to achieve. More than half the church peeps would hear this and immediately disagree that tithing is required, necessary, or even beneficial, and dare not appear to the greedy little immaturities that you are in any way over blessed. At least they assign you their little greedy badge they so proudly wear as they drive off in a car that barely runs. Oh, I know there is much discussion in this, but I'm trying, if I might, to remain somewhat focused. At least we end up in a three-ring circus. Ha, see the play on words there? So anyway, God loving a cheerful giver means little to them as they give to whomever they choose. Now we must not read the book of Acts how when the believers, the authentically born-again believers, got saved, and how many of them were compelled to meet the financial needs of the church by selling off most, if not all, of what they had. I guess having all things in common was an honor for them that could only be achieved by using their resources to take care of themselves and others. Perhaps we should read it to believe it, and maybe even for some to do it. Acts 4, 32, 35. Now the multitudes of those who believed were of one heart, and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Hmm. They gave everything they had, they were of one heart, one soul, and they operated in great power, and great grace was upon them all. I don't know, it just sounds like a good batch of ingredients that I would want all over my life. But okay, so this is not about money, but about selfless ambition, right? But wait, now if we are motivated by the ring rung or hoop, then is it not safe to say that it is for the purpose of gain? Now should we strive to do well at work, in our business, in his ministry? Yes, of course. Daniel was ten times better than those who did not know God. And his promotions came about because he used the gifts of God in righteousness, regardless of his workplace rules. Yes, regardless. And yes, the gifts of God. You mean he used the gifts of God for personal gain, Ken? Hmm. You see, it is here that we can see the difference between a person of God who puts God first and one who is in it, that is, in Christianity, to get something out of it. Yeah, but no, you see, they want to get it legally, which is why they are often religious. Daniel 1, 18, 20. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, 
none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all of the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. So are you a sea-level worker or minister? Or are you a ten times better than the outsiders? Hmm. I know and have seen many sea-level contenders right in the body of Christ. For sure, many of them were wolves in sheep's clothing and had ulterior motives other than serving God and his people. Perhaps we saved that for another message. But so now you see I keep trying to separate out the hoop, ring, and ladder thing from the money thing, but I cannot seem to do it. Ambition so seems to be tied to money as well as other things, but for sure, money. I played a game once, which went something like this. One of my good friends stated once that a person could not spend all of Bill Gates' money in a lifetime. And at that time, it was $67 billion. Now, my immediate reaction was, yes, I surely can. It was at this point that we had disagreed. So I went home and I began documenting a shopping spree. And lo and behold, I did it. I left Bill Gates with an empty bank account in one day. Now, but you say, what did you do with the money? Well, I went to my personal mission and purpose statement and assigned the money to those things I had wished long ago I could do if I lived at least as long as Methuselah, which was 969 years old, Genesis 527. Now, being about a decade older, I reflected on that exercise and wondered if I had made the world a better place by changing and improving the things on my list. Did I improve upon its destiny, that is, the planet, which is and will be with total and absolute destruction. Then I did what Ken does, which is to take it all the way out and imagine a world that I could fix just using money and placing people in their proper vocation and ministry. Imagine that the whole globe is a project. Now there, I have done something that will last until the earth melts. Hmm, you see what I'm running into here? My appetite for the things of heaven was spilling onto this rock. And somehow I had come to believe that we could actually make it better. But unless sin, the old human nature, death, hell, and of course the dragon have been put in their proper place, destiny will come no matter how shiny we polish this rock. Jesus took the keys to death and hell, paid the price for sin, defeated the devil, provides us an opportunity to gain a new nature, thus putting to death the old nature, and well, promised us a new heaven and a new earth. All of what is destroying this planet was taken care of by one man, and his name is Jesus, and he didn't spend a dime doing it. So if you missed it thus, my dream of spending all of Bill Gates' money would simply add a band-aid to the problems of the world. The best use of money, of any money, after we have squared away our families is to place it in the hands of God. The hungry get fed. Kids without parents can be given a fair shake in life, if godly systems are given the resources to create communities whereby these parentless orphans can grow up. Imagine a neighborhood pulling together and creating a small city or town whereby the influences of the world can be kept at bay while they, the kids, learn what it is to know God, to obey Him, and to be prepared and equipped for the work of ministry. Their new parent would be the community of believers living on site. No religious institution would lay claim to it in its efforts. Jesus would be the center and the Bible the instruction for life. Of course, there would be a library in the school of schools, of which I have already designed. <laughs> you see, such a utopia, and could but a little money square away one such problem. Yes, but how much could you pull together in your city? Second Chronicles 1, 11, 12. Then God said to Solomon, Because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may judge my people, over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. 1 Kings 10, 23 and 27. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and he made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores, which are in the lowlands. Okay, so if you have a poverty spirit, you get to make a new decision, given this maybe new information to you. Though our money earned not with selfish ambition may not save us from sin, 
the old human nature, death, hell, the dragon, nor will it buy us a new heaven and earth, but glory be to God, the one who became poor, that we would become rich, took care of all those things, that we might be presented with an opportunity to decide what to do with our wealth when we make it. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. But Ken, do I stop trying to do anything? Nope. Just keep an eye out on your motives for why you do and behave the way that you do at work or in ministry. Find your place and be the best version of yourself in that position. And but above all, do the things fitting of a Christian. Just like in the case of my creating a utopian world would be a waste of time and all but impossible, so would jumping through the hoops of mankind, grabbing at the invisible brass ring, or misstepping on a rung that wasn't put in place by God himself. And keep this in mind, Ecclesiastes 10.19. A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. And without explanation, we finish with Joshua 1.8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Well, that's it for today and for this message. Remember, it's not what you find wrong or disagree with regarding these messages, but what you can take away from it. Together, we can do more to impact the kingdom than if we work alone. Let's flip the script and kill, steal, and destroy the works of the enemy and create space for the light of lights to shine through into people's lives. Find a seat and click on the like and subscribe button. Let's build this ministry together. Thanks and see you next time in deep waters.